everybody. Welcome to the garage and the court of public opinion with the door slamming in the background. Uh, Peter Clayton is behind the camera. I'm Jeremy Cordo. Um, the 20th of November. Uh, memorably, the day that somebody, we'll get to the dates later, but he invented the traffic light. The traffic lights. Interesting. Speaking of things you remember, I do remember when I was with 5DN, years ago, we would ring a family who had become famous here in Adelaide for really a fabulous Christmas display, Christmas decorations. They would put it up every year, hundreds of miles, I'm not exaggerating, hundreds of miles of Christmas lights. God knows what it cost. People would come from everywhere. It was a tourist attraction. TV stations would be there. I, and I don't know, it was north, out north somewhere. Does that still happen? I don't know. Are you going to put up some decorations this year? Are you going to do it? No. Pete, oh, really. Christmas spirit. I haven't got any, Jeremy. No, I don't either. Well, I've I got a few, but nothing, nothing you could put around the house. In, in a room, you know, Christmas tree and bits and pieces. But if you're not going to put anything up, uh, maybe you could ring me on, on Friday uh, and tell me why not. 0491 65 68. 60 is my number. JeremyCordo.com. 9 to 12, live streaming, interesting guests, phone calls. You, maybe? I see more and more homes dressed up for Halloween. Why Halloween and not Christmas? What's going on? I don't know. Apart from the silly season, there's the festive season, and also the bushfire season. Now, this is interesting. Out last Thursday from Deakin University, the biggest study of the Victorian bushfires, these were tragic, tragic, a tragic event. Among other findings, it was questioning the value of controlled or what they call preventative burns. Now, I've always been very skeptical about that because so many times a controlled burn has gotten out of control and created more of a problem than they were trying to fix. Now, I hope to have the author of that study, Professor Don Driscoll. I hope to have him on the show next Friday morning really like to talk to him about what he discovered. The federal government wants to take big money out of politics. Now it's aimed at elections actually because you'll never get big money out of politics. We'll talk more about it on Friday around the dining room table but it sounds to me like the two major parties are getting together to try and exclude smaller parties and independents, whom they would probably regard as nuisances. A limit of 90 million dollars for a political party to fight an election. That seems like an extraordinary amount of money to fight an election. Because you can go to all the talk stations and all the news stations, news programs, and get it for free. I don't know why you, you waste your money or why they waste their money. Well, anyway, our money. Well, our money, yes, that's perfectly true, our money. Uh, but look, if Clive Palmer has anything to do with it, it'll all end up in the High Court. Clive, by the way, spent $150 million at the last election. You remember he bought these full double spread pages in the Australian newspaper talking about his. See, now I can't even remember what the party was called. But he spent $150 million on advertising to achieve absolutely nothing. You'd think you'd sort of look at that as an example of, well, what's the point? Anyway, I think $90 million is too much. The two major parties spent over $100 million at the last election. It's a good thing to look at, but I, I, 
I'd want to check out exactly what their real motive in, in changing this law. Um, make it, make it, um, Michael Yabsley in, in New South Wales, he was a state member of parliament in New South Wales. This has been a hobby horse of his for years and years and years. He reckons that each political uh, candidate should be restricted to spending $200 on the campaign, his campaign or her campaign. He'd be interesting to talk to, too. The Thought Police at the ABC are at it again. Mm -hmm. A new list of banned words and phrases came out Monday, last Monday. Out are expressions like Chinese whispers. Can't say that. Indian giver? Nope. Nitty gritty. What the hell's wrong with nitty gritty? I don't even know what nitty gritty means getting down to basics or uh, the, the, the... What's wrong with that? Pow wow. Pow wow's out. Verboten. Gone walkabout. <laughs> Can't say that. Spanish flu. No. Nope. Palmy bastard. No. Can't say that. Blackballed? Absolutely not. You really would think that the ABC would have better things to worry about, wouldn't you? Amazing. They should be out there campaigning for free speech and free thought. And they should employ a department for the removal of woke. But that ain't going to happen. I don't think in my lifetime anyway. But you never know. Peter Dutton may win the election and he may have the um, chutzpah to go in there and put a dose of salts through the place. Protesters, as you might have read, descended on Meyer in Burke Street Mall in Melbourne. Somehow these people, flying the Palestinian flag... Somehow they think they can weaponize the kids who come along to look at the Christmas decorations in the Maya window. This war has got nothing to do with them. But I suspect these protesters have nothing to do with Palestine either. Any more than the Extinction Rebellion people have a lot to do with climate change. What they're really on about, I don't know, but I'd love to get one or two of them across a table and have a, a chat on the air. Oh, Bill sent me this, which I thought was so clever. Bill sent me this. Bill says, um, if I get a loan at the bank, I'll be paying it off for 30 years. If I rob the bank, I will be out in 10 years. And Bill says here down the bottom, uh, he would really like us to follow him for more financial advice. <laughs> but listen, hang on, Bill. Listen, I really think you're onto something. <laughs> uh, it all depends on whether the judge has a sense of humour, I suppose. Uh, I must be getting old. I, I, don't, I don't get schoolies. Uh, Pete, did you ever go on one of these schoolies no, things? No. Mm. <laughs> Extraordinary. 20,000 kids to send on the Gold Coast. And here, locally, they head down to Victor Harbour. But the Gold Coast is the big deal. To party, to booze, drugs, you name it. Girls, boys. Flirting with danger, dicing with death. Oh, it's all right. The previous Labour government has organised pill testing. Mm. Uh, the uh, a newly elected Liberal government is not going to have the pill testing next year. Uh, and I agree with that. I think it's just a terrible example to set. There's no way you can condone the business of taking drugs and then somehow 
telling the police who are there to try and keep things safe to look the other way. Where's the duty of care? Parental oversight? I just would not let a child of mine go to schoolies. Letting down your hair is one thing, but this is all too risky. Too risky. Um, something else I noticed and followed up during the week. One of the symbols of woke that is most obvious is that person to one side who is using sign language. You know what I mean. Usually at a media conference, particularly at government media conferences. Now, when I sort of first saw it, it's been going on for a long time, when I first saw it, I, I, I thought, well, mm, that's, a, that's a considerate little touch. But when you dig into it a bit, according to the last census, there are only 16,000 people in the entire country who know and use sign language. Ladies and gentlemen, 16,000 people out of nearly 28 million. If you tried to express that as a fraction, I don't think it would even be registerable. Why? This is another case of a government trying to fix a problem that doesn't exist or is really minuscule. Ring me up, tear my ears off if you, you, you think I'm wrong. They, would have, they have subtitles on televisions these days anyway, don't they? Well, yes, they do. <laughs> and, and, and the way most deaf people handle life is that they lip read. Yeah. Yeah. The sign language thing is a dead thing. Well, according to the, the, the census report, now, you can Google that if you like. Now, don't forget one of our great sponsors, the Rising Sun Inn, 60 Bridge Street at Kensington, just off Kensington Road. It's a lovely old building filled with atmosphere and character. It won the uh, Best Pub Inn Award a few months back, and you can see that proudly displayed in the bar. It's a beautiful bar, too. I don't know how old the bar is. It, it's, it's got some patina, but it's very warm, welcoming, atmospheric, uh, great wine list. Although I must be careful of that. Great wine list, and uh, the menu is fantastic. Grant will make you feel very, very welcome, whether you're having a end of year Christmas party, but you better be quick in order. I don't know, you'd have to book. Uh, I'll have to check with him to see if there are any bookings left. Uh, it's a very popular venue, and I understand why. It's, it's very, very successful. A lot of people have known it most of their lives. And we're creatures of habit, I know I am. Um, the Rising Sun Inn. Uh, romantic dinner for two, or a um, product launch? Uh, end of year Christmas party, whatever, the Rising Sun Inn. You'll really love it, and it'll become one of your most favourite places. I know. I really do. Let's say, just hypothetically here, the use of fossil fuels do add to global warming. And I'm not convinced, but let's say for the argument, wouldn't it be logical to concentrate on those countries who do the damage, the most damage? Those countries who produce the most emissions, China, India, Indonesia, America, Europe. Anthony Albanese will happily make life difficult for us to achieve nothing. But why? Why? It's truly weird. Unbelievable that he gets away with it as well. Nobody questions him on any of this stuff. We can't use our cheap coal and gas, but we can sell it to China and India, who use it to the benefit of their people. 
and they do it without any criticism whatsoever. China uses our coal and gas to manufacture, for example, solar panels and wind turbines and then sells them back to us. <laughs> this is textbook insanity. Perhaps even more unbelievable is that people seem to be buying it. Or more correctly, paying for it with outrageous electricity bills. And another thing, no one seems to think or care about how we dispose of these things in the end. Solar panels have got a life of about 20 years. Then you've got to take them off the roof and do something with them. Wind turbines, lifespan of about 25 years, at which time I'm told it'll cost about $600,000 to dismantle and dispose of each of these turbines. Who's thought about it? More importantly, who's going to pay for it? Um, how much time have I got, Pete? Uh, it, yeah, a couple of minutes, yeah. Port Stanvac. Port Stanvac, I see, will sell its former coastline oil refinery site as prime residential real estate. Hmm. This state Labour government says it is residential, the residential property of a lifetime. I hope I've got that right the residential property opportunity of a lifetime. Now look, I agree with that. I really do. This is beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Right on the beach living. But, hang on a sec. Isn't the official Labour line that all seaside property is under threat? Climate change and all of that? But I think I was, going to see, I was going to say deep down, I don't think even so deep down. I think they know all of that is a load of crap. Waterfront real estate will always be very desirable. And with this particular real estate, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. But clearing it of pollution will be the key. It's been, a, it's been an industrial site for yonks. Uh, maybe one little thought before I leave you and remind you about Friday, jeremycordeaux.com, 9 to 12, around the dining room table. This one's interesting. Along with the law to ban children under 16 from social media, which I probably agree with, don't know how you actually pull it off, but I agree with it, introduced our new digital duty of care laws. Well, that sounds like a motherhood sort of statement, doesn't it? Duty of care laws. The government says they want to control the harm or potential harm that can be done by these online platforms. And the coalition agrees. Well, I think anybody would. But when you stop and think about it, you've got to say, have we, gone, have we gone barking mad? Social media companies will be forced to, because uh, there, are, there are big penalties involved here, they'll be forced to keep Australia safe. Keep Australia safe. <laughs> Wonderful thought from reaction of harm or reaction to things that could be harmful they will now have to prevent the harm. I'll leave you with that thought. How in God's name are they going to do that? How is that possibly going to work? You know it's just sort of like the the nanny state. As far as the social media thing I think the the, uh, the horse has bolted. I don't know. Um, again, my printer isn't working. <coughs> so we'll do it off the... Um, 
<coughs> do it off the screen. November 20. Happy birthday if you're having a birthday. Happy wedding anniversary. In 1923, on this very day, American inventor Garrett Morgan. What a great name that is, Pete. There is he. Garrett. Garrett was a steam train, wasn't it? A big, great, big, beautiful thing they called the Green Garrett. It was a steam train. Anyway, in, uh, no, a different man. Uh, Garrett Morgan patents his traffic signal design, adding a caution between the stop and the go. An important development in automobile safety. Happy birthday to the traffic light. 1917, the first successful tank is used in battle at the Battle of Caramello in World War I as Britain uses this new technology to break through the German lines. That was 1917. You know the tank, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, the tank is an Australian invention. But the bloke who invented it had terrible trouble trying to get the army or anybody to look at his technology. Um, and I think ultimately the Australian army didn't want a bar of it. I think ultimately it was the British army who took up the idea of the tank. Uh, a little bit of history. Uh, Lewis Waterman, American insurance agent, but mostly remembered as the inventor of an improved fountain pen. I love fountain pens, don't you? That's not a Waterman. But I, fountain pens are lovely. 1837, this was the day he was born. 1945, the Nuremberg War Trials begin as 24 Nazi leaders are put on trial before judges representing the victorious Allied powers. 1945, on this day. 1925, on this day, Robert F. Kennedy was born, brother of JFK, former Attorney General and presidential candidate and sadly victim of an assassination. Rolls-Royce announced the acquisition of Bentley Motors on this day in 1931. 1889 and Edwin Hubble, the American astronomer, discoverer of galaxies. Wouldn't that be good to have on your tombstone? <laughs> Discoverer of galaxies. Born in Missouri, or as the Americans call it, Missouri. I don't know why. He died in 1953, born 1889 on this day. Sherlock Holmes' first story, which was called A Study in Scarlet, is accepted by publisher Ward and Locke with payment of 25 quid. Wow, 1886. Beat starving in a garret, Pete. <laughs> um, 1858, American puppeteers Jim and Helen Hansen establish Muppets, Inc. 18, 1958, golly. Took them a while to get the Muppets thing up there with Sesame Street, didn't they? Gosh. Um, 1838, William Painter, American inventor. Crown cork bottle cap and opener, born in Maryland, USA, 1838, the whaling ship Essex, attacked and sunk by a sperm whale in the Southern Pacific. Good on you. Good on you. Well, you know, look, you, you declare war, you start it. You can't always finish it the way you want to. Only eight of the 20 crew eventually survived. Mostly they, were di they died through cannibalism. See, whales don't do that kind of thing, do they? No. No, people do. In fact, the reason it, it turns up, I suppose, is that it, this story about the Essex became the inspiration for the novel Moby Dick, 1820. And the wonderful James Hardy, Australian winemaker Thomas Hardy and Sons, Sir Thomas Hardy, in fact, Sir James Hardy, I should say, yachtsman, Born Adelaide in 1932, and he died last year in 2023. Um, a couple more. 1521, the Arabs 
a tribute, a shortage of water in Jerusalem to Jews who were making wine instead. 1521, Pete. Yeah. They haven't gotten on for a long time. <laughs> Uh, mind you, I, I, I could get into trouble for saying it, but <laughs> I, I don't know if the Jews make good wine, but I, I understand exactly what they were doing. Um, 1942, Joe Biden, 46th President of the United States, was born on this day, 1942. Sleepy Joe, God bless you. Thank you very much for viewing the Court of Public Opinion, ladies and gentlemen. We will be back with you Tuesday and Wednesday of next week with more stuff. And, of course, on Friday around the dining room table, 9 to 12, jeremycordo.com. You might like to ring me. Love to have you on the show. Believe in yourself. I'm Jeremy Cordo. Peter Clayton and I wish you a very happy week. Believe in yourself. And goodbye from the Court of Public Opinion. <laughs>